Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, everyone, for jumping on. Welcome to, I suppose, what we're going to hope is it's going to be a really useful hour for you. I'm sure Robin and Tim will echo this, but it'll probably only be as useful as some of the stuff we get back out of it. We're certainly keen on ideas. Um, so my name is Don Barrell. For those who don't know me, so I look after the regional academy system uh, within the RFU. So all of our, our pathways into the, the pro game. Look, really, really delighted to hand you over to two experts tonight. So in Tim Hall, um, Tim's looking surprised I've called him an expert. So Tim, you've got to back yourself there. Um, so Tim was um, at Quinn's previously, Robin at Leicester, both now work for the RFU. Um, and really, there are experts in player development um, and in terms of what we do with, with young people, with adolescents, um, and trying to ensure that we bring them through to the, the top end of the professional game from whatever point um, we pick them up as really robust, healthy, long-term um, athletes and people. So that, that's their primary driver. Just to sort of background on why we're doing this, um, there's been a fair, fair amount of talk as we've been going forward on when we can get back, actually, what will players miss out on? Um, certainly from a coach's perspective, coaches, I think, very keen to ensure that players feel, I suppose importantly, engaged, cared for, um, and then ensure that they, that, you know, their development for those of you towards um, some parts of the game doesn't lack or nothing is missing. Um, and then also, I think, just to ensure that they maintain robust. And what we don't want to see happen is we, we go from, you know, stage D where we've had no contact into or limited contact into towards ENF where we're going to start to be able to increase things a little bit and, and just ensure that we've still got that, that long-term aim in mind of keeping people healthy, keeping people fit and helping deliver really, you know, sort of competent young athletes onto um, the stage. So I'm going to hand over to everyone. Thanks for spending any time with us. Um, it has been recorded and we will send it around to everyone else. If you've got questions and you want to send them to me privately um, on this group so I can ask them on your behalf. If you're not happy asking in front of the group, then feel free to do so. Otherwise, whack it on the, the chat functions. We'll go. So I'll hand over to you guys. Perfect. Um, thanks, Don, Mark, for warming everyone up so well, as uh, Salty put it. It's possibly downhill from uh, there then, but um, I like Salty's idea as well of keeping everyone on mute so you can just heckle through the message board uh, <laughs> rather than straight at us. That's outstanding. Um, yeah, I'd echo Don's uh, thoughts and just thank you very much for giving up your evenings after you know busy days at uh, work and uh, coaching, etc., to listen in. Um, I think we'd probably all acknowledge that whilst in some ways this may be maybe not the most exciting of subject areas, I think there's still huge value in raising some of the issues as we go into a unique period um, post the challenges of COVID and uh, shine a light on a few of those um, areas. So, yeah, we'll try and move through it at a decent speed, but nevertheless, feel free to use the message board, ask questions that are relevant to your environment. And um, yeah, hopefully everyone will find uh, a few bits in there that are useful. So with that in mind, I suppose our aims for the next um, 40 minutes or so um, would be, first of all, beyond the four here would be, I'd like every coach, before they step foot on the grass over the coming weeks and months, whether it's for a training session or a competitive opportunity, to just have in their mind and have gone through the process of what's the purpose of this session or outing or competitive opportunity, um, what's gone previously, i.e. what's the context and where's it leading to and what's the long-term vision for this group and for the journeys. That would be, if we get to that, I think we've done well. Um, but I suppose to break it down, what a privilege it is to be talking about actually, um, yeah, details of rugby sessions and competition, it's generally exciting. Um, and I think whilst some of this at times, I hope doesn't, but may come across as being cautious, we're certainly not looking to be killjoys. We're massively excited to see these boys returning to the field of play and of course, um, young girls, and we want to support that. We're just mindful that we're not just about the next 12 weeks, we're about the next 12 years of these um, young players' careers, whether that's engaging in the game recreationally or at a professional level. Uh, we're on a raise awareness then of some of the potential challenges, um, which you'll probably already be aware of, and importantly, share some solutions. We've got a few ideas, but they are just that. I'm sure you'll have plenty as well. And when you come to leave, I hope everyone feels empowered and has some ideas 
an awareness around how they might shape the player's experience. Um, and that would be a big sort of theme through this is we, we can break convention. Um, we don't have to just play two lots of 35 minutes, 15 aside. Um, we've got opportunities to do different things and to, uh, yeah, be actual think deeply about how we go about creating those experiences and journeys from here on. So with that in mind, uh, Mark mentioned ideally not having a radio silence, um, but what are your current considerations that you guys are facing when you're planning either individual sessions or your sort of short, mid and long term scheduling? Um, I reckon we've probably got a feel for some of those challenges, but only you know what you're facing in your environments and it would be useful for us to be aware of it. Uh, it would also be useful um, for you guys to be aware that you're probably not uh, alone in those. So 30 seconds so on the clock, fingers on the buzzers, fill the message board with um, considerations and challenges um, that you're facing. If we get nothing, we'll have to hear the challenges that Robin and Don are facing. And yeah, kids fighting, Don, is not going to uh, cut it tonight, mate. It's going to be rugby related. Um, we got anything coming through? Rob, what would be your thoughts around things that you sense is going on out there at the moment that are challenges for coaches? Um, well, I think the first one might be, you know, walking into a bit of the unknown. So the game in which we're potentially going to be playing would look slightly different with the adapted laws. So there's potentially something I'd be thinking around. Um, you know, what impact would that have on um, a player's experience both from a rugby perspective in terms of actions in the game but also you know my bias would be from a physical perspective and, and how that, that might impact you know the physical load um, imparted on a player and um, which we potentially will touch on in a little bit more detail later so that that, that would be something yeah um, that there's oh yeah we're starting to get some stuff through now yeah, so I think one of them that's just popped through is so important is that different stages of uh, readiness um, for both contact but also for wider games. So that's something we're going to try and touch on and really important that people are um, yeah, mindful of that. Um, the balance is coming through in terms of we're now going to have, yes, there are windows of opportunity for whether it be school fixtures, Academy League International, but nevertheless, there are multiple stakeholders at play here uh, and everyone is going to be excited about getting fixtures on, including the players. Um, so we need to get a balance. Really important word from Chris, uh, I think that's bang on. Um, yeah, you've got uh, bubbles being a, a challenge in how you're integrating groups um, forwards. Uh, Willis, I guess we're talking around things like, granted, whilst there's no scrum and mall at the moment, collision-based elements um, and yeah, that part of the game, as well as line out being a uh, consideration. Um, yeah, and we've also got pieces around yeah, the long term progressive return to rugby and uh, contact. So, yeah, guys, loads of really good stuff uh, coming in. Yeah, multiple teams. So, communication being absolutely the cornerstone of everything and player centered approach to getting the balance uh, right. Um, that's brilliant. Um, really good stuff. So with that, mate, you keep, uh, guys, if you keep dropping those in and as a few things come through, we can, um, yeah, touch on it. But Rob, do you want to just uh, give us a bit of context, which was just talked about, the different stage of readiness? Do you want to pick up on that, mate? Yeah, well, I think as with anything, before we start trying to look ahead and plan ahead, you, you know, you can't do that without having a real good perspective of where we've come from history and you know it's been tough and I know we've all lived through it um, but I think just to spend a couple of minutes now just you know recapping on you know what the last sort of nine months has looked like really from from a rugby exposure perspective and and sort of some timelines and, and how that might differ to, to typical and um, so Tim if you if you just click on for me Yes, mate. Sorry, I'm so busy with the message board. You're absolutely on your own. You have to uh, <laughs> hang me out to dry. Like, yeah. I think, like it was literally nine months. I, I, I won't apologise for just going through this um, for a couple of minutes, but it was literally nine months ago where we were at a stage where all players or all, all people were, were able to do was engage in individual training with one other without any kit. So so far removed from from the game, um, you know, and the only. The only thing that started to resemble anything like rugby 
um, was sort of in stage D, sort of in September time. So you're talking six months there of, you know, a wide variety at best of engagement uh, for some absolute no engagement in physical activity, depending on, you know, their circumstances, the level of motivation, their access, etc. cetera. Um, so clearly, you know, that, that has a significant impact in terms of what the body um, is essentially conditioned for. Um, and yeah, look, look, we were making great progress. And then clearly we've just come out of a second national lockdown, which has, has almost halted or stunted the, the progress we had made throughout August and September. So, you know, tremendously exciting that we've got an opportunity to progress to stage E and hopefully F in the coming weeks and months. Um, I just think just because we, are, we have a green light to progress to those fixtures, hopefully we'll address throughout the, the talk how that could protect, doesn't necessarily mean you have to. It doesn't necessarily mean that that has to be the only thing you do now with these players. There is a tremendous excitement to start getting back to some form of competitive element. Brilliant. I love that. I'm all for that. Um, but like Tim said, on, on his, you know, his final point on the aim slot, hopefully we can sort of empower each other just to try and look at things differently. Um, so, yeah, Tim, if, if you're able to just click on. So, again, if we compare, you know, where we've been with, you know, what you typically see. So along that that first row, like, you know, end of a season would typically be in April for players. And you potentially would just have, you know, four to six weeks off before, you know, resuming training again in June, July. Um, and, you know, if you put yourself, you know, you, you strap your boots on, put yourself, you know, in, in a player's you know, in a player's position um, and remember back to when, you know, when we all play, like, I think we all feel that those eight, six to eight weeks of pre-season are absolutely essential after that four to six week off period. And um, I think we would all agree that we couldn't just go straight back into fixtures and be absolutely, you know, on the money. Um, so I think we all agree that we'd need that time. And, you know, if you look down at the bottom layer, this, this is essentially what we're dealing with, a significantly elongated period of deconditioning, um, you know, which is just the way it is. And I don't think we can, we, can, we can hide the fact that, you know, there's going to be a significant challenge um, to, to all of our players engaging in, in fixtures, um, which if we just you know, persevere full steam ahead without consideration to how we can manipulate the schedule around them. So whether that's appropriately scheduling fixtures one a week or two in a month, etc., that could be one thing. Or uh, in, in addition to, you know, manipulating the training week in order to make sure that players are in best position to be ready for a fixture and also recover from a fixture. And... Um, I think, you know, we, we need to make sure we've, we're thinking along those terms as opposed to just slipping back into, well, we're in season now, you know, it's we're in season, it's week after week, it's league fixtures, et cetera. We're just not in that boat. And like like Tim said, you know, we've got the opportunity to change convention, break convention and, and do things slightly differently. Rob, and, just uh, on yeah. that, if I may, mate, I think when we talk about the value of that pre-season, of course, part of it is preparing for that one-off outing or fixture but also the reality is it allows you to train and compete regularly and so yeah. we're now into a situation where we're not just preparing for a one-off fixture but numerous fixtures so I'd be almost viewing these coming competitive opportunities as part of your ongoing progression and development a line hasn't been drawn in the sand um, mm. yes it's great news and we can start to do things that we weren't able to do before but I just think we have the end in mind and we're working towards that using Saturday as another opportunity um, to do so. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think we're all in a position where we, um, we're we aware that people can sort of do things once, maybe twice. But eventually, if, if we've not got the, the appropriate preparedness or we're not allowing for the appropriate readiness, i.e. being in a fresh state to attack those opportunities in, in the best possible state, then it will eventually catch up on us. Um, so, yeah, so I think we can't deny that, although it is tremendously exciting that we've got opportunity for competitive fixtures, the gulf from D to E is large anyway, but then stick in another four-week um, lockdown in the middle of that, the gulf then just becomes significantly wider. So, um I think, you know, as guardians of, you know, 
these these young rugby players managing their schedules, their training activities, etc. We just, you know, we have to tackle that front on and accept it for what it is and, and manage it appropriately and not just, you know, slip back into our traditional, you know, Saturday, 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 Wednesday, Saturday approach that we would do in a typical season. Perfect. Yeah. So I guess Rob's done a great job of outlining some of the historical context that we're operating in there. Um, so I guess one of the things we'd hope to do here um, would be to provide some ideas to help bridge the inevitable gap, which is through no one's fault of what the constraints were of a roadmap at stage D to where we now are and the opportunities moving forward. Um, and I hope we can do that. So I guess this is briefly touching on just some things that we're fairly confident about. You'll have seen it in your own practice. Um, we've seen it anecdotally. Um, the research also supports it. Um, our number one priority is we want to get players playing the game they love. But there's a balance to be had around getting um, short-term enjoyment and development, challenge and all those things right, as well as preserving and preparing for the long term. And I think that's a real skill that all of us are going to have to show is how we can use the upcoming opportunities in an appropriate fashion to get players to fall back in love with the game, have the elements that they enjoy, um, which they've missed so dearly and desperately, whilst continuing to move players forward um, towards the end goal. Uh, we know that competition and matches come with a much higher risk. That's you know, apparent research is clear on it and we'd see it in our own practice and um, yeah I'm sure you guys are all seeing that therefore we need to respect the matches um, we need to be prepared for them in reality and if we don't feel we can be prepared for the version we want to play then we need to just dial back and tweak and change the constraints the environment the rules um, so as to make it appropriate um, yeah sharp increases in training load um, I think it was Alex, great point on the message board, and he's made it in a really eloquent way. Talks about, yeah, the risk of an increase. I think he talks about a spike in player load or a shoot in player load when you're involved in multiple environments. Um, yeah, and talks about that acute load. Um, yeah, so we know that's also uh, an added component we've got. As you can see, the reason we're having this chat is because potentially we've got the perfect storm. A lack of previous training or history exasperates the previous points. Well, at the moment, we're ticking all the boxes, um, yeah, due to circumstance. And if we want players at any level to go on and engage in the sport for a long time and to enjoy doing so, we need to make sure they're fit and available. Furthermore, if we want them to get better, they need to be available to take every training opportunity to learn on the field of play. Um, and therefore, availability could be argued as being one of the best abilities. And so we want to avoid picking up any issues during this period of time because it's not a one-off injury. The chances are it may rear its head again and it can come at inopportune moments when players are getting opportunities um, to really push their case. So it's our role to try and reduce that and it's our duty to do so. That said, we're not alone. These are just some examples. Lockout obviously being um, previously in the NFL, um, but when they had their restart, a spate of soft tissue and uh, connective tissue issues. Um, we're even seeing it in a multitude of team sports at the moment, irrespective of budget, whether they're professionals who they have numerous contact time, huge numbers of coaches, sports scientists. We're still seeing these issues, uh, particularly in team sports and particularly in contact sports. So we're not alone. Um, the challenge is there, but I'm also confident that the fact that guys and girls like you are on this call you're outward looking, you're reflective and thinking deeply and therefore the influence you can have on the young players you're working with is huge and similarly with the coaches you're working with and the ones you go and train with or play against and you tweak and change things, I think your good practice will really spread like wildfire um, and we're really reliant on all of you going and spreading that uh, message and leading with your practice. And I really like the bottom one um, because you've got... Klopp, Klopp and Guardiola discussing potentially tweaking the number of um, substitutions, etc. within Premier League fixtures. Well, if they can tweak and change the format of their competition, um, where winning and financial implications are significant in our space of enjoyment and development and engagement, we can certainly tweak and change what our um, competition looks like. 
um, so as to get the optimal outcome. Um, so with that in mind, Rob, do you want to touch on some of these session design um, principles and yeah, just elaborate on a few bits? Yeah, I think where, where we're potentially getting to is if we're looking across a continuum from left to right, um, you know, the opportunity to play games sticks is very much on, on that right hand side, you know, in a very specific, complex, highly chaotic and fast environment. And what I guess we, we just want to we want to emphasise and want to guard against is that everything we now do sits on that very far right, considering the fact that we've probably been you know, much closer to that left hand side um, for a significant period of time. Um, so, so like Tim said, like one of the most important things is to try and be progressive um, when it comes to preparing players to be able to tolerate the demands of, of, of the game. Um, and in some instances, simply just playing the game uh, isn't the best way to get there. Um, because, you know, like, like we said before, you might be able to get away with it once, but over the course of two, three, four weeks, that's when it will start to catch up with you. So I think, you know, whilst we're in a, in a position where we can now start to play fixtures, the purpose of this slide is just to, again, let's really, let's really try and zoom out and be really balanced with our approach to make sure we're ticking a lot of different elements, not just from a, a short-term perspective, but that's what we would sort of push from a holistic development perspective anyway. And, you know, we would often, you, know, you hear the quotes, competition is um, a great servant, but a poor master. Um, and I, I very much agree with that in the fact that we're not, um, you know, we're in a development mindset. So there are many, many different ways for, you know, to provide a brilliant experience for young kids. It doesn't necessarily have to just be a 15 by 15, two by 35 minutes fixtures, you know, with the rules that we all traditionally know and love, we can be, we can be a lot more um, creative um, if we allow each other to be. Tim, if you, if you click on. Yeah, and Rob, just I suppose the final thing that was raised really well on the message board, you're layering on a contact onto um, all of that shift to the right-hand side, just the number of collisions um, and mate, if I can, just before you go, yeah. in, this has made a really good point, um, which we will come on to touch on. And Robin's starting to allude to about how the game is going to look different. Um, yeah. And so Robin and I'll certainly look to gather some information via movement uh, or GPS. But I must admit, Don might be better positioned, but um, I'm not aware of any formal studies being conducted on what the different or the modified rules will produce in terms of a uh, game outcome. But of course that is something we can do time allowing. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. Um, mate, absolutely derailed you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, like, just touching on that point, we do have, you know, we have had you know, GPS data, for example, from a Wellington festival um, where we did look to try and adapt, you know, certain, rules and, and variants to try and promote more touches and, and, and higher ball in play time and you know typically the intensities that you do see from a running perspective are significantly higher than what you see in a typical game um, and that makes sense really because the time spent you know setting up for set piece elements scrums etc um, you know and, and promoting you know, faster restarts less ball out of play time means there's more fatigue in the game um, so potentially there is more opportunity for space um, and therefore more line breaks. More line breaks means, you know, more running, et cetera. So um, we don't necessarily have gold standard literature, but we have started to try and try and evidence those things um, just to try and inform essentially what we're, we're doing at certain festivals that we're in control of. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting point, but I think, you know, we, we've all we've all coached or played the game for long enough to understand. You know, we would probably put money on these law variations leading to you know less obviously set piece elements because they're not in the rules. But that the consequence of that will be you know higher potentially higher ball in play and much higher running running demands. So, and um, right trying to get back on track. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so uh, just just build, building on from the last. Um, the last uh, the last slide. Look, this is a, a slide we put together for a previous presentation, just around how we, you know, how do you provide like a balanced, holistic development picture for for a player? And um, because 
you know, it doesn't always just have to be full bitch 15 on 15, not preaching to the converted here. I know you're fully aware of that, but you know, at its, you know, at our most regressed in lockdown, you know, we were down in sort of the, the bottom layer, really just looking at more of an individual uh, development. Um, and, the, and even, um, and even, you know, as we've progressed through the stages, stage C, stage D, we've only really got to sort of those modified touch variations. And now, like I said, we've got an opportunity to go to 15 on 15, which is fantastic because that's the game that we all know and love. However, let's not just go there now because we can. Let's not neglect the other elements because there's, you know, if you're going to distribute your time or young rugby players' time training and playing, um, as you can see by the visual, like you can, you can, you can divvy that up a number of ways and from just a general development perspective without like ignoring the physical stuff we'd argue you should anyway um but then from a physical perspective one of the things that is that you know from that we know from the research like monotony and doing the same thing is what leads to overuse so actually you know cycling activity going full pitch 15 on 15 and, and coupling that with smaller sided variants and position specific skills is you know providing like a really nice variety to sessions and exposures and throughout a week that that mean that you know you, you potentially can get more training time and you potentially do safeguard players from overworking the same musculature etc so there, there's a holistic development piece but also you know safeguarding players um from from injuries as well which 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 we believe you can do well, I think that's such a good point because the temptation, of course, having not being able to engage in that form of activity is, well, now we're going to have a competitive opportunity. We better practice this as well. So then yeah. what you end up with is not only the addition of it on, in air quotes, game day, but additional work on it around, uh, yeah, the lead into the week, et cetera, as well, which, yeah, in terms of training monotonously and um, cumulatively obviously has a significant impact. Well, I mean, you yeah. know, like just to provide some insight, when if I'm preparing for a, an under 26 nations test match at the end of the week and having conversations with coaches, if I've got a Monday session and a Tuesday session on consecutive days, you know, my theme of each day from the parameters I set, like we discuss as coaches, are different. So if Tuesday is our, our tougher session where we're going more transition based, 15 on 15, full pitch keeping the ball in play, potentially more collision-based stuff, then that's great. But the Monday might be more you know, higher rest periods in between efforts so we can get quality. It might be that we, we bring the pitch in a little bit so we're not you know, increasing the opportunity to sprint as much. So you can see like we might get more change of direction on a Monday because it's smaller. So we're distributing. Although the time, you might spend 60 minutes out on the pitch both days, but the, the the way that that 60 minutes is, is made up and the load that's achieved is different. Um, and actually it's that variety um, that's important. Um, I wouldn't be an advocate of just doing the same parameters with ball in play the same amount and the pitch parameters the same with 15 v 15 all the time because I don't think that um, is appropriate from a physical development perspective, definitely. Um, Perfect, Robin. So obviously most guys in this call will be aware, but for those who want to do a bit of further reading, that would come under that sort of banner of tactical periodization yeah. um, that would align with your physical qualities potentially being delivered via s and um, Yeah, to overemphasize the physical quality on the field of play within a session so as to bring about adaptation, etc. Right, Rob, I think you're on question time, mate. And don't you go throwing it at me like I did to you on that first slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess like considering what we've just spoken around and so merging two slides in terms of the timeline and some of the the things we we would know and understand from from experience and from research like what things typically would shout out at you then in terms of being mindful of or being wary of or, or ways or if you've got any inspiration based on what you've been thinking about as we've been talking about. I just think it's a good opportunity to, to now share and, and start to pose some further thoughts or questions if possible. Um, so yeah, a quick 30, 60 seconds, a quick 30 seconds must be the same as a slow 30 seconds, I presume. So stupid comment. But um, yeah, if you, if you can just spend a bit of time and just throw in some comments, that would be great. And then go from there. Yeah, and I think what's really promising whilst um, 
yeah, people are working on that is even looking at those first comments, like the level of awareness and reflection yeah. of terms around load, um, multiple stakeholders, different environments, contact, positional specific stuff came up around the forwards. Um, even had questions around yeah, the difference in game demands, etc. So I think really promising in terms of the lines of thinking that people are operating on. And I think that's really exciting in for us to what Bo's on this call and yeah, similar coaches can go and do and how good a job they can do in yeah, managing this next period. Um so just having a look whilst these come through. So Rob, we've got one on um, anything to might propose on advise on remote training coaching for this time of year. Yeah. So of course we talked about the November lockdown, but a great point is we're now going into a Christmas period to add a bit more um, yeah, disjointedness, if that's a word. Um, yeah. So any uh, thoughts around that, particularly around building a base for contact? Yeah. Rob, thoughts? Yeah. I suppose like when I'm thinking around preparing players for contact the first thing I'm thinking is is firstly around mastering our own body weight before we're working against any sort of external stressor i.e another person um, and clearly the situation as it is currently with Covid like you're limited um, with what you can do with other people anyway but I think there's heaps of work that you can do around um, you know crawling and some I'd hate to use the word gymnastic because I don't think we're potentially get blessed enough to do all those gymnastic based movements but you understand my point like that kind of stuff would still be good foundational preparatory work for contact and if I was rehabbing someone with a shoulder injury if I was in early phase pre-season I would be you know I'd be getting them crawling I'd be getting them carrying you know fireman's carries log carries different different derivatives of that I'll be getting them wheelbarrowing and um, all that kind of work is it, it's just great development for young kids anyway just exploring movement and exploring their bodies rolling tumbling falling backwards rolls forwards rolls star rolls etc I think all that kind of stuff is still really valuable foundational work we probably don't see it as linked to the game but in terms of preparing our body for the more intensive and specific nature, I still think it's extremely valuable. Um, and then look, depending on what you may or may not be able to get access to or what we're able to do from a COVID perspective, then clearly there's there's heaps of you know, contact and bag-based progressions, getting up and down off the floor, pancake rolling, um, you know, colliding with bags, grappling for a ball, etc. It's all safe and progressive prior to the actual event of contact and collision. Tim, I don't know what your thoughts are. No, mate, I agree with um, all of that. Mate, great job. I suppose looking at it even more holistically, which I don't think was necessarily the aim of the question, but of course, if our players can return in a really aerobically fit state as well, we've got the ability to adapt and maintain better technique during periods of intensive play or ball in play. Um, we've also therefore got the ability to make better decisions and make those decisions earlier. So I suppose as an aside as well, if our players can come back fit, that's not to say we run them all Christmas, um, but if they return in a fit state, we know that that fatigue element can also be eliminated around the contact area to an extent. Um, but yeah, no, great, great point. Um, and again, we've had another one just saying, it's dead right, we've got such a range of what players have done and the state they're in. And we're going to talk about that briefly um, in the part of the skill is to progress the group appropriately but within that we've got to differentiate within our group um, and we may have some players who can go and get away with a bit more than others so how do we manage to yeah work that into the game um, is a uh, yeah a massive yeah. challenge Tim just on that as well I think you know we all you know we all coach and um, because we enjoy coaching there's an element that likes the competitive element and how that might reflect on us as well but you know, we, we will have all missed coaching and we'd have missed the experience of coaching on a game day as well. But it's not about the result for us. It's about the experience for them. Um, and that's exactly it. So it might be, you know, the phone call, not just within your team and there's a variety, but also, you know, picking up the phone to the school coach of the opposite school who you know you're going to play at the weekend trying to find out a bit more about their circumstance, what they've been able to do from a training perspective. And I think 
that's a really good leap and a good step forward, just extending an arm and having those discussions to go, you know, how do we make this experience the best experience for our group, given the constraints we've been put under? And, and, and you know what, you might ring them and they go, you know what, we've actually been really good. We've had great resource, great opportunity to get on the grass and do lots of stuff. I'm more than confident that our guys are prepared to do three by 20 minutes um we might just take some extra players to rotate in etc and then that that might be absolutely fine but until you've got prior knowledge of that um i don't think you can have those productive conversations and start to adapt the discussion so i think that's really important um because i think this year more than ever um i mean you saw it in the premiership like with the, the squads rotating the amount of one-sided games um was ridiculous and what we want to try and make the experience is competitive, enjoyable for all, et cetera, not these 40, 50 nil experiences. Cause you know what, it might be great from a win ratio perspective, but it's, it's no good from a player experience and development perspective. So I think there's little things there you can do as well. Um, just around that. Right. Yeah, really good. And I'd, I'd say, yeah, so my challenge will, would be to extend when we talk about our group of players, as coaches now, um, that our group extends to the opposition as well. Yeah. So planning in advance of your competitive opportunity, what it's going to look like and what's appropriate for both groups. Um, should one group be able to bring a bigger squad than the other, then potentially mixing up so that you can rotate and uh, get an appropriate balance of uh, time on field, etc. Yeah, that would be the sort of challenge I'd have in these early stages. And that's not to say we completely take out the competitive element because that's what makes the game what it is um but yeah there might be some of the thought process around that so yeah. I was... and there's an argument um you know com competitive exposure is great for the guys that are selected you i don't know what it's been like but you might have found that in your environments because of you know the nature of the fact there's not been an outcome at the end of the week engagement might have been better with training it might have I, I don't know um, in terms of your coaching groups you might have had more players with a smile on the face because they've been more engaged in the whole sessions evenly and so you've got to be mindful of that you know going back to your traditional 23 players in a squad you might be leaving out 20 players and what's the collateral damage of that and during these times when there isn't a competitive structure um is there benefit to that i don't know like that I think they're, they're just questions you need to explore within your own environment and your own context. But I think it's all pertinent. Um, yeah. What we're trying to do, we're trying to maximise enjoyment, engagement for a long period of time, whatever level. Yeah, mate. Brilliant. Yeah, certainly if we thought of squad selection or squad deselection, would we uh, approach it differently? I think that's a great, really good point. Um, so PE teachers will be getting excited now because it's back to GCSE. Um, so they'll be writing their element. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Um, so we thought we'd look at um, some of the actual session sort of makeup and constraints and history of what's uh, gone on over the past uh, month or so using just this principle, because they are things that we can control to an extent within our planning and our programming and scheduling. Um, so I guess frequency um, is a fairly straightforward one in that, well, during uh, stage D, it'll have varied hugely. So this is arbitrary to some extent, just to give an example, and you'll know your environment. Um, but what may well be about to happen is having been stationary, we've now been into a lockdown where frequency may have dropped, certainly in terms of rugby specific training. Um, we've come out the other side, which is really good news. Um, and there's then the temptation potentially we may have been training, for example, twice a week. Well, in some environments, we may now add a Saturday fixture, which involves warming up um, up to sort of 60, 70 minutes of time on feet. And then we want to make sure we're ready for this competitive opportunity. So having already added one significant dose of work that's now bigger probably than most of our training sessions were originally, and we're now about to then potentially add a team run on a Friday to make sure we're ready. And all of a sudden you can see how the frequency of just yeah, time on feet has uh, changed and shifted. So... Yeah, I'd be encouraging people as an action to sort of plan ahead. Um, if you know that that's where you'd like to get to and you haven't got uh, any fixtures and you have an opportunity, you might introduce a Saturday training. So the frequency is already there. It's just a modality that's going to change. Um, and I'd encourage people to be mindful of what's 
been done previously. You know, um, I suppose someone like Martin Bouchette always has said, if I was to plan a session or try to plan a session, so my first question, besides their long-term goals, is what did they do yesterday and what are they doing tomorrow? And I think that's our mindset, albeit in a longer-term picture here, is what have they done? Where are they going? And how does this fit appropriately as part of that uh, journey towards the end point? Um, so, yeah, that would be my sort of very brief take on frequency. And I guess in terms of intensity, if we, if we think about working back from the game, um, you know, those actions in the game that, that are of high intensity, is, and you know, we've addressed it, like sprinting being one. Um, so if you take sprinting as an example, the opportunity on a full pitch, you know, the opportunities to sprints are significantly higher than if you, you know, you go back to stage C where you're working in groups of six and in small areas. Definitely significantly higher when you're in a November lockdown. And I can't imagine there's a huge amount of people going out and doing genuine sprint training. Um, it would typically be you know, your low steady state road runs for the more motivated. Um, so the golf there is significant. So we've got to be really sensible and progressive with how, with how much of those kind of activities we dose over the coming weeks. So, you know, Tim will, will talk, we'll talk about, um, well, Tim just mentioned around frequency, but the time spent in certain parameters, I think would be an important one as well. And you know, the time spent in full pitch, the time spent allowing, line breaks and the time spent allowing um you know longer periods of play um in the most intensive uh, elements of the game i think would be really important um you know stagey with the adapted rules will potentially as, as we touched on previously you know allow for a greater ball in play um so we can be really smart with how you know we might adapt adapt that and you know, we've got a slide later on with some more suggestions but you know the inclusion of regular huddles uh, or breakouts for example um water social distance breaks. huddles obviously Just social like, distance uh, yeah two yeah. meters apart obviously and um, water breaks etc might be a way to to help reduce the intensity and intensiveness of that particular bout because we know collisions and contacts tough enough but piling a load of fatigue as well and people aren't quite getting into the proper position and then they're, in, they're extending an arm for a tackle or they're overreaching or getting in a poor position that's when we might start to get some issues so you know trying to you know periodically you know engineer opportunities within the the game outside of your traditional half time for for breaks I think is a really smart thing you can do and um, you know number of number of game involvements will be increased by the inclusion of contact so not only, you know, will people be getting their hands on the ball, but obviously they're involved a bit more by nature of tackling, carrying, uh, rucking, etc. So that needs to be considered. So um, potentially you might offset that with the time spent again, like in certain activities. Um, that, I mean, one of the main drivers of intensity is that by it being a competitive fixture, there is a genuine competitive element because there's an outcome. So that immediately will drive the intensity a bit up. So. Uh, these are all things to be aware of off the backdrop of minimal intensity. So the take homes, you know, like we've spoken around, is that progressive reintroduction to gameplay, consideration of different game formats, um, which Tim, I know you've got some good ideas, so you can jump in on that, to be fair. Um, well, so I've got some ideas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah Rob, that's, um, yeah, perfect. And again, yeah, I suppose around that, uh, yeah, Again, seeing the words progressive um, reintroduction, we're not at the end point. Um, yeah, and the game format bit we think is huge. And that's actually where, you know, all of these guys and girls on the call are experts in that area. Um, and will no doubt have many more ideas and be much more skilled at uh, tweaking those. Um, so yeah, I suppose time is another of the qualities that we've got um, at our disposal and control. Um, but yeah, being mindful that whilst we will have had periods of gameplay, um, they were typically been broken down by skill or rest and recovery, um, rightly so. Uh, whereas now we're going for for longer periods where we would have had high intensity periods of ball in play, followed by either line out, scrum, um, potentially more potential penalty infringements coming from those um, kicks at goal, etc. Well we may lose a lot of that. Um, 
And so we need to be mindful that the time spent or the density of work, which Robin will touch on um, in a moment, will be uh, different. I think also the time spent on specific tasks. You know, there have been certain things that stage D and the previous stage simply haven't allowed. There hasn't been work of a breakdown. Um, you know, whilst players may have done some line out work, in reality, it hasn't been uh, in game based um, yeah, situations where, you know, actually maintaining possession has a real consequence. Um, yeah, similarly, some of the PSS and kicking base work may have been done in isolation. Has it been done in chaotic environments when it's uh, when players are under fatigue, etc.? Um, and then you've got the November period where some of that may well have dropped off um, with the best will in the world. And we're now returning to introducing some of those um, skills, as well as, as Robin showed on um, the slide, with a lot of other things at the far right hand side. Um, so we need to be, I think, just aware of what hasn't been done and just how long it hasn't been done. Um, yeah, so those novel skills, if they can be introduced progressively, um, I think we use the comp competition opportunities as part of that development. I think we need to be mindful of the whole weekly piece. Um, so if we know we're going to get a lot of something on Saturday, hopefully we're already prepared for it because we wouldn't be doing it. But if for any reason we find that actually we know that's going to happen and it's maybe out of our control, let's not revisit it during the week and pour petrol on the fire. Maybe we acknowledge hey, the horse has bolted in this particular instance and we're just going to make sure we've got whilst low preparedness we're going to have really high readiness going into that challenge um, at least be fresh for it um, and again considering to modify the games um, yeah being probably the current strand or an, an example an example for that just to bring it to life in sort of a real world context is say when we get round to like seven season um, in the school environment um, and guys have been prepared for 15s for the majority of that season in preparation we know that sevens comes with significantly higher running intensity, sprinting intensity. Um, now, if if you've only got a week or ten days, a week to prepare for that for that fixture, you know there's going to be you know significantly high amounts of sprinting. That regardless of if you did no training, the amount of sprinting is probably going to be higher than what is normal for those for those players. So what Tim means by pouring petrol on the fire is by training in a sevens format and again exposing the opportunity to sprint higher that discrepancy from where they have been to where they're potentially going to go from a weekly load perspective just increases significantly further um which actually would be more detrimental so what we're saying is like if you if you know in advance you've got four five six weeks um so although we've got the green light to to play two by 35 minutes you might say i'm not going to do a full proper game for another six weeks and all of my competitive fixtures are going to be modified, then that's great. But if 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 you're only in a position where you can play, you know, the game we know in the next two weeks, like Tim said, let, let's freshen people up and give them the best opportunity to go well. And then let's be really mindful of it on the back end because what code goes up must come down. Um, and the peak of game day currently is is, is like Everest compared to you know, just a more of a, a gen, I can't think of any hills at the minute, but yeah, I've got out of mind blank. But you, you get my point. What goes up must come down. You've got to respect um, the time course of recovery and adaptation. I've had a, I've had a shocker there. You're <laughs> loving it, mate. The geography teachers are uh, yeah. in their heads. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that that's something definitely to be mindful of. Um, like from, from a line out perspective as well, like, there's definitely work we can be doing now in prep. So I know we've mentioned briefly the contact stuff, but you know, being being dropped from a meter and a half in the air for a tall, gangly lad um, is is extremely stressful. Um, let alone doing it after not doing it for nine months. So you know, working like single leg hop and sticking, jumping and sticking, jump, trying to jump in the air without being lifted and sticking the ground in, um, potentially doing some step off a 30 centimetre height or off a, a small fence or ledge or something and landing it is all actually really important preparation to bridge the gap. And all that needs is a two, three minute breakout twice in a session on a weekly basis to start to bridge that gap. Um, so I think there's just some, 
some things that can be done just to bring that to life really. Um, and then, yeah, just moving on to, to time. Um, it's a fairly, I think this one's probably the most straightforward of them all really, but you know, we've been limited in stage D to 75 minutes once or twice a week. Um, and, you know, when we get into a game, that in itself is 70 minutes of game time. So if you take into account stoppages, that might go to 80, 85 minutes. Then you take into account a warm up. Um, you're talking 100, 105, 110 minutes total. Um, and then couple that with the fact that there's opportunity and potential that training sessions might go on longer. Um, the disparity, again, between what we have done and what we potentially will do um, is significantly more. So again, like, the whole piece needs to move. So you need to think around how am I going to progressively gradually increase my biggest session of the week to facilitate what a game day might be, but then also be mindful of the total time spent in training in the week. So whilst one session might be increasing in length to facilitate that, you might actually reduce your other sessions like other sessions slightly so that the total time spent in the week is still progressive and not everything's increasing by 15 minutes. And before you know it, you've done another hour and done another hour and a half before you know it. So just a few things there to consider. Yeah, um, yeah. sorry, I just realised as well, on the previous slide, of course, when we we're talking about the different modalities like jump, land, et cetera, that was, of course, type of activity. I'm pretty sure I said time, just to confuse matters. I'll still be thinking of hills. Um, yeah, Rob, you happy if we keep... Yeah, we've so we got an eye on the... Uh, yeah, the time. Um, I think we can probably just brush over this really, um, but just a few things to consider. Um, but again, we've we've touched upon this in terms of preserving or distributing different sessions with different aims. So certain sessions you might want more speed, more more density, i.e. the ball is in play longer than it's out of play. And you might go for more space to allow more opportunity to sprint and it might be longer or that. That needs to therefore be balanced with the other side of the coin. And if you're doing back to back days or back to back sessions, these principles by dialing up and dialing down means you can get really good outcomes and good time on the grass. However, potentially preserving or protecting from a physical perspective, because, you know, one day is more smaller sided. The next day is larger sided. One day there's a lot more rest and recovery and less fatigue in the session, whereas the next day, there might be significantly more fatigue. One day might be shorter, one day might be longer. So you can be really cute with how you manipulate those. And Tim, if you move on. And of course, to do that, decent um, communication with any other environments of what's been uh, going on is yeah useful yeah. to help achieve that. Um, so on the final home straight, but hopefully um, still yeah. useful and equally uh, yeah, adding some value, I guess. So some of the things that, we'd like to see and I'm sure already happening but when we come to plan these competitive opportunities what do you, we or you as the coach want the game to look like for your players each week would be something at the forefront of your mind isn't appropriate progression from the previous week um, ties in with I think a lot of the message that's been pushed and driven today uh, are there any individuals it isn't optimal for came up right at the beginning some really articulate thoughts around different people from different uh, environments having completed different amounts of work so is there anyone it's not appropriate for and then we challenge ourselves as coaches to how we uh, manage to individualize within our group this is where you guys can really come to life in terms of what rules constraints tweaks to the environment um, do we need to achieve point one point two point three um, and how can we be creative with that and uh, yeah move the opposition to uh, yeah follow a similar line of thinking and then just like Robin's been discussing what needs to either be added or removed from a the training week that's we're currently in but also hopefully we're planning longer term um, so what needs to be done in that respect um, so as to ensure that we prepare appropriately and hopefully navigate this unique period in a safe but really successful fashion so these are just a few ideas that have yeah put down but in reality you will have vastly more uh, appropriate ideas and experience but you might expect to see things like larger squad sizes allowing for rotation 
potentially fixtures with three teams with the team not playing having a task um, or some skills based work or something else to be done um, Robin and I've also had good success within camps or training sessions where actually we've had one team waiting out the back yeah. so potentially playing for a certain period of time or to score or until there's a uh, yeah, break in play then one team comes off next team comes on and actually immediately you're only on field for two thirds of the time uh, the team that's off generally seems to use that opportunity really well to engage in reflection, um, particularly if that was something that you were able to support. So that might be an avenue to explore. Also keeps many more players involved, tying in with Robin's point around engagement. Um, around the patella tendinopathy stuff, making sure we know potentially who we're throwing to a certain number of times. Um, could be a job for parents to uh, with a clicker um so yeah track that which should have them on the edge of their seat so i would have thought um using rest periods like water breaks to reduce fatigue um but of course the flip side of that is we do get a rise in intensity the fresher people are for each uh, play playing around with pitch parameters width obviously increases number of collisions within reason length might be something we could um reduce so that we've not got quite as much high speed running um, and line breaks, etc., or such um, significance. The breakdowns a brand new stimulus. So, is there a point where we potentially think, well, actually, we've had a few more breakdowns than I was expecting? So, do we encourage a low chop tackle, which allows for offloads? Do we incentivize line breaks that come from an offload? Do we make the breakdown non contested? Um, kicking long would encourage, obviously, a lot of uh, yeah, running based movement. So can we uh, encourage people to kick short or kick for possession? The duration of games, an obvious one. Um, yeah, it goes on. I won't, um, yeah, patronise you by suggesting I've got or we've got all the ideas, but they're just some of the lines of thinking that potentially you might be, uh, yeah, touching on. Bibbing up individual players who have different, if you want to call it superpowers or modified rules to suit that individual who we talked about being in a different um, context to the rest of the group. But the biggest take home, before you go onto the pitch, having an idea of what you want the session to look like, whether it's training or game, where it fits within what's gone before and what's to come, and then how are you going to modify it, ideally prior, but as well using your coaching expertise on the field of play to bring about that outcome. Um, and hopefully we'll have some really positive experiences and I'm personally yeah, really looking forward to getting on the touchline and uh, yeah, seeing some of the lads playing and seeing some of you guys uh, doing what you do and coaching. But should you have any... Uh, I think we've questions? timed perfectly, mate, because we've been an hour. Mate, so I'm just... absolutely buzzing with that 60 minutes. Um, we've <laughs> yeah, rattled through the last couple of slides, but we've got there. Um, so any questions, please send them over. We're very happy to try and help. We can only offer our opinions. Um, if you have any queries around the actual specifics of what can be done um, or COVID related roadmap based questions for club support emails, your best bet, all the emails are collated and then are distributed to the appropriate department. Um, and then on this uh, link, which will get uh, sent round, is a real simple summary of what each stage involves, which is nice just to a fresher to what's been before, um, but also therefore what's uh, permitted at this point so well done. i don't know if anyone Robin, has questions no, yeah i think uh, that was the ask i was going to give look gents well done that was brilliant and for for those of you on here hopefully you got a sense of how much these two actually put into managing our young players in the pathway and also how much thought needs to go into it has anyone got a question they feel is worth asking the group or is it a bit of a killer one that you think everyone needs to hear an answer to I'm happy you unmute and shout it or type it I always appreciate it, it takes a brave moment if you want to do it no. sent everyone to sleep Don, we've done them yeah there you go, well if not I know um, Mark you've, you've recorded it um, again just big thanks to Tim and Robin for their time and, and putting this on and um yeah, testament to the good work you guys are doing. So, well done. Perfect. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone. Salty, is anything from you? Or are you uh, are you okay? No, all good. Thanks, Don. Excellent hour. So, yeah, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Lovely. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, thank Take you. Take care.